the presentation properly. Yes, it looks great. Presentation looks fine. Nice. The recording is started, and I want to welcome everyone to this uh, presentation of the master thesis work um, of Walter and Anton that did it in NATEC, uh, West in Gothenburg, uh, this year. And they were working on our little uh, autonomous core project, and they tried to implement some visual simultaneous localization and mapping, or visual SLAM for short, uh, which is basically just using a camera, a single camera on top of all, to try to figure out the position of the car and its environment. And yeah, the rest will be presented by them, the problems, the findings, and the results, which all I think are really great, but I don't want to go too far and let them do the talking now. Go on. Awesome. Um... Yeah, you already said some things that we want to say, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so uh, hello and welcome to our master thesis presentation. Uh, Walter and I, Anton, are happy to present to you our project of implementation of visual simultaneous localization and mappings. As uh, Ante said, it's short for VSTAM or SLAM um, for the simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, as yet Razor as an uh, AI kit as a basis for navigation is a subtitle. So we're going to start today with the uh, uh, start today presentation with uh, some um, uh, what is the purpose of this project? Why SLAM is uh, interesting in general and visual SLAM in particular? Uh, and then we're going to talk a little about how how you typically implement this and our strategy of implementation. Uh, before we show you some of our results, uh, especially the 3D reconstructions. Um, and then we're going to dive into the discussion. Uh, and this in this section, we're going to focus most on uh, the issues in this project and uh, the, our examples of future development. And finally, we're going to conclude with some main conclusions. So the background then, uh, as you know, autonomous units are used more than uh, now than ever. Uh, for example, this car on the right hand side, autonomous vehicle, you have these uh, delivery uh, drones or robots and uh, vacuum cleaners. Uh, and what these all units all have in common is that they uh, improve safety because they can react more, much more quickly. They have a broader width of, of uh, sensory range. They can see behind themselves as a human cannot and uh, uh, similar things. It also, uh, they're also not as easily distracted as a human can be. Uh, another huge benefit is that they are more efficient. So uh, the environmental benefits and the cost benefits are, are quite high with these units. And of course, not the, not to, to not the least is that they, they free up, uh, frees up time for humans to do other things than vacuum or floor, for example. Um, as you also can see in this image, uh, it probably uses a radar or a LiDAR, so it can accurately describe the distances uh, from the camera to the uh, to the objects in, in the environment, but it has one big flaw, uh, and that is, uh, for example, an autonomous vehicle, it cannot read traffic signs or traffic lights. So cameras are often crucial in these applications anyways, um, but if you flip that question, do we need the LiDAR or the radar, for example, in this case, or can we use only cameras since we have to use them anyways uh, to, to measure distance and, and create a map of the surroundings? So this is what we set out to do. Uh, we tried to, to create a sparse 3D map of the environment used for navigation uh, of the most important features in the, or, or objects in the environment. Uh, our objective is to implement this on a small scale to prove a concept. Uh, so we are evaluating the uh, feasibility of the concept itself, uh, the 3D mapping, and we're not focusing on the execution time. Uh, we're using a monocular camera, as Andre uh, told you about, and that means we use one camera instead of several to prove a point that this concept is robust, and thus if, it, if it's viable for one camera, it should work for two or several as well. A little bit about the platform. Um, the Jet Racer AI kit uh, is what we use. Uh, this is based on the Vidya Jetson Nano. So uh, you can see this on the right here. Most of you are perhaps familiar with this by now. Um, it has a powerful graphics card for machine learning. Um, 
that is the main purpose of this unit uh, whatsoever. So uh, this is what is really good at, and also a wide wide angle uh, lens camera uh, oriented to the floor. You can see here on the left hand side. Uh, just a disclaimer, uh, it's uh, common to confuse computer vision as a subdomain entirely of artificial intelligence. And uh, yes, they are very related, but computer vision is in itself also a complete own domain uh, using mostly graphic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, visual uh, and geometric uh, algorithms, so optics uh, that is not uh, unique for artificial intelligence. So we're not using neural networks here. Uh, we only use a geometric approach uh, to create the 3D reconstructions. So, <clears throat> so with that, let's get in a little bit on how this actually works. The problem with um, images is that they're 2D and they don't give us any inherent information about uh, the depth in the image of the 3D space. So in order to uh, get that kind of information, we need to uh, reposition the camera. And if we do that here, we can see that the object, we can see that the cup here has moved quite a lot. Um, whereas the potted plant uh, hasn't moved that much between the images. And that tells us that the cup is actually closer to the camera, whereas the potted plant is further away. And this is this is the uh, this is what we're going to use in order to then find out the depth and the, the actual accurate distances in the uh, in the scene that we're observing. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find some features to track. So first of all, we uh, we take our original image and we make it grayscale, and this is because the the colors themselves don't actually give us that much information. So by doing it in grayscale, we don't really, really lose any information, but the computational time is quicker. So then we're looking for um, for some features, and you can see here in the in the right image that um, the some image some features that our orb detector has has picked out as it thinks is the best features that we can track. Um, and you can see that it really likes the the leaves on the potted plant, and that is because. Uh, it's looking for high contrast areas. Um, so the, the very dark leaves on the very white background is a very high contrast area and all the, uh, and because they're uneven in their, in their shapes, there are even more contrasts there. And so the orbit detector really likes these features and that's what it's going to try to track. Um, it is worth noting here that we're only showing the 800 best features that we could see. Most of them are on the potted plant. If I'd shown all of them, then you probably wouldn't see that much uh, because it would just be full of features it's, it's uh, finding. However, you'd still have these empty areas here uh, and on the table and the wall just because uh, there aren't really any features that attract. There's just nothing there to sort of, and not really any. So once we've uh, detected these features, we have to go and uh, match them. So we detect features in both images, and then we use a brute force matcher. And the brute force matcher takes all of the features we found in the first image and matches them with all the features in the second image. This results in quite a lot of errors. Um, you're matching features that don't, might only exist in one, um, one image. Uh, you might have several features in one image mapped to one feature on the second image. Um, and just uh, as you can see here, a lot of them are not correct. Uh, again, worth noting is I'm only, we only visualize say 15 features here, otherwise you wouldn't really see much. Uh, so then we need to filter our, our matches and we do this by using a ratio test. The ratio test works by um, looking at, for every single feature in the first image, you take the feature and you see the two best matches in the second image. If those matches are very similar, that means there's a high probability of an error, and so we're going to discard it. If they're not similar, then you know that you have a very unique feature that you can track, uh, and so we're going to keep track of it. And then you get a result, something like this. You will still have a few errors, but most of your features will actually be accurate. And again, it's worth noting here that we're, we're not showing all of the features that we're tracking and matching. Uh, just because we had to cap it for visualization. Uh, now that you have your features, 
that you're tracking and that you know that you have robust features, you can you can try to triangulate these in uh, in three D space. So with these feature points, you can estimate the new camera position and pose. Um, and once you have estimated the camera poses, you can then go over to actually estimating the 3D depth uh, of your feature points. And then lastly, we use a method called bundle adjustment. Uh, bundle adjustment is there to refine our estimations of the camera poses and of the 3D, um, 3D, feature, 3D feature point um, estimations. Uh, it's also used to fuse more frames, so as you're doing this over and over again, you're going to get duplicates and bundle adjustment fixes that issue. So um, for most computer vision applications, uh, you have these uh, things called distortion. So due to how the, the lens, uh, the shape of the lens, the convexity, light refracts in different uh, ways. So um, you get these things called radial distortion. So you can see here that you capture more of the frame due to the wide angle lens, but to the edge of the frame, you get uh, some uh, distortion. It gets bent, uh, it, it, it bends uh, outwards. So you can see some example of this on the uh, picture frame on the wall and the bed frame and the couch, they are all bent uh, uh, to the edge of the image. And this could be an issue. Uh, because uh, due to this distortion, the radial distortion, uh, if one object is placed on the left-hand side of an image or on, oh, sorry, uh, on the right-hand side of the image, uh, it gets bent differently. So a computer won't recognize that the same feature is actually the same because it's uh, it cannot match the it cannot match these features to the, to each other. Uh, and how do we solve this then? Uh, we do a thing called camera calibration. So we try to uh, mathematically uh, determine how bent is the picture outwards and uh, and distort uh, this, uh, undistort this. So uh, you can see here that all of the edges that were actually bent outwards are now straight as they are in reality. So now can they can be used for feature matching. Um, as for the results, we, we uh, collected some video recordings to have something to test the algorithm on. So this is a drive through uh, Baltus Flat, uh, a couple of frames of it. Uh, and I want you to note some specifically uh, impactful objects. So in the left side of the first frame, you see a corner below the refrigerator. You see uh, a door threshold in that second image and also the skirting board uh, below the wall. And you can also see a laundry uh, basket and uh, a table leg here. And I want you to remember this, uh, these uh, objects for the rest of the presentation. Uh, so, and of course we did this uh, with several different uh, video recordings for different resolutions and different tracks uh, as well. But this is one of them. Uh, so this is how this uh, typically mo uh, moves in the environment, I hope. Uh, so uh, you can see it, that we move rather quickly and we're turning rapidly as well, and that it shakes uh, from uh, mounting the thresholds. And this is important uh, later in this presentation. Um, just before we dive into the reconstruction themselves, uh, I, I will show you a little bit what happens under the hood. So you can see here that there are some green circles that depicts uh, features that are uh, tracked in the three or more frames, uh, and then the blue circles are features that are tracked in two frames, and then the black diamonds are features that cannot uh, be mapped to a 3D point. Uh, you can also see the feature trails here, uh, so you can see the history of a feature, how it moves between frames. Uh, so the last 10 co consecutive frames, for example, for this feature, how it has moved. Uh, so this is how that looks like under the hood. Uh, you can see here some edges and you can see also uh, how the 2D image points are mapped to 3D points in real time. Um, so what is the resulting 3D reconstruction then? Uh, you can see here from what I asked you to remember before that you can see the outlines of corner for example below the refrigerator. You can also see the outline of a 
uh, threshold, uh, the wall, the laundry basket, and uh, the table leg. You can. I will also show you what uh, the floor uh, looks like uh, in a second. Um, one thing I wanted to note before we proceed is that some of the poses are missing uh, when mounting the door threshold because they're so blurry images, so we cannot detect, uh, we cannot match the features. So some poses are missing and then it relocalizes itself after uh, it, it, it shakes and then it can carry on. So this is another one of these edges. You can see the edges uh, here and you can also see the floor plane on which the jet racer is driving on. Uh, we also wanted to test for this particular video uh, how the radial distortion would affect it. So we assumed no radial distortion between image frames and analyzed the results. And as you can see, uh, the 3D points are, makes little sense. It should be somewhat like walls and a threshold, um, like the other image. Uh, and also, we know that the jet tracer was moving in a fairly straight line, and this is curved into an arc for this estimation without the radial distortion. Uh, and uh, this also deteriorates rapidly until it fails completely. So uh, we can conclude that the calibration was very important in the end. So because the jet racer video was very well, it was moving very quickly when we captured the video and also we get a lot of motion blur and and uh, and some shaking. Uh, we decided to try this with a smartphone instead. So we have uh, image stabilization and uh, we moved it very slowly and we also get very high resolution. And we chose to film this guitar because a guitar has a very distinct shape. So you'll be able to see uh, clearly where this object is and, and where all the features are uh, in the reconstruction. You can also note that there's a there's a bookcase here um, behind the uh, the guitar and a wall that we're also going to see in the reconstruction. And, and this is the reconstruction. And you can see clearly that there, there is a guitar here with a stand and um, and it's also started to um, to reconstruct the areas behind it. If we look at this in 3D, now the red is the tra trajectory path of the camera. And and this here behind will be the um, uh, the bookshelf. You can also notice that there's an area behind the guitar that's not mapped, and that's because we actually never filmed that. Uh, but it's clearly a guitar. You can see all the shapes um, and all dimensions seem to be more or less accurate. The thing is, though, that they're only accurate up to a scale. There's sort of ambiguity here that the, the, the units are arbitrary. And uh, so, so in order to rescale everything to real world coordinates, we need to take a ground truth measurement. So we estimated that the distance between the camera trajectory path and uh, the guitar is about half a meter. So then we rescaled everything accordingly. Um, and what we ended up with is this video, uh, same video, but rescaled. And about half a meter between the camera trajectory path and the guitar, and then another meter back to the wall. Which is which is uh, which is according to the real world measurements also. Um, and a thing to note here is that the guitar still has mostly uh, has the same shape. Everything there's no distortion that's been happening from this rescaling, and that's because even though we only took a ground truth measurement in one one dimension by rescaling everything the same amount, uh, everything is still accurate, and and we can measure this and we can see that. The width of the guitar and the height of it, it's all accurate in our reconstruction. Um, as for some discussion now then, uh, we uh, found that the image, image quality is very important for this uh, application uh, or in most uh, computer vision applications probably. Uh, so we have some motion blur. If you remember, we recall that uh, the jet user was mounting the threshold. Uh, then it shakes a lot, so we get these smudged uh, images. So even though it tries to track these features, the probability that they are uh, identically smudged between images is very uh, low. So naturally, this cannot be used for the tracking uh, for the image, um, uh, the feature matching at all. 
Uh, there's also an aspect of resolution blur. So we tried for 480p to 1080p, and we saw practically no differences in performance. However, it's logical to, to, to note that if the resolution falls too low, then you cannot do any feature matching uh, uh, either. So um, another thing to note in this image is that uh, about half of it uh, consists of the floor plane. Um, and this is not ideal for two reasons. Uh, first of which is that not many distinct and unique features are found in the floor. So it's not that useful for the 3D reconstruction in, in terms of mapping uh, the, the pose of the jet tracer or the 3D environment. And the other reason is that the floor is not that interesting. Uh, we are more interested in the walls and the objects to circumvent uh, and navigate through. Uh, so. Uh, the angle of the camera should uh, be facing a little bit more upwards. Uh, some more platform and dependency issues. Uh, we, had, we have some stochasticity issues in our code base. So the code base has uh, some random variables and this affects the results in a way that it's a little bit of variance. So the same test run could yield different uh, results, uh, but this is an, a large issue. Um, there's also an issue about the current Python uh, implementation. So the li libraries used today, uh, do they don't have very good support uh, and they're not very well documented. It's often just translated from C. So uh, there was both that and that they, when implemented on a Jetson, you get a lot of errors that cannot be resolved. So we're theorizing about either implementing all this in C or together would be slam. So that brings us to what to actually do with all of this and, and where do we go from here. Um, and, and we think um, an interesting aspect would be to clear up the, the visualization a little bit, make it easier for us to understand what's going on and also then eventually easier to, uh, to navigate through. My, for example, um, adding shapes, predetermined shapes instead of uh, instead of the the current uh, points. So in this case, you might want to outline walls like this or objects by placing spheres or or um, uh, or boxes. Uh, the, an alternative, perhaps an easier solution, is just to uh, use all the points but make them larger and. And then when you want to navigate, um, essentially ask the jet racer to um, to sort of try to avoid all the as many points as possible, um, just to give it a little bit extra space. Uh, we'd also like to see currently all of this is basically done on a CPU, and um, most of these processes would benefit from GPU processing, if not all, and. Um, uh, that's quite difficult to do with Python at the moment. There's not that much support and, and you need to rely quite a lot on your CPU, even if you do manage to move some processes over to the GPU. And so this this is a rather big task and it might be more suited for C code, but it would yield really big um, performance improvements. Uh, also currently the uh, algorithm doesn't find when it's come back to an area it's been before. So there is a risk of drift over long periods of time and also doubling up of features if you drive over the same area again. So a loop closure would fix this. It would fuse points that are doubled up and uh, prevent drift. A motion model could also be um, helpful if, um, for example, earlier we saw how uh, some poses were missing because of the, the blurry images while driving over the threshold. An emotion model could help estimate um, where where the um, the robot is, uh, even when it's not finding any any feature points to match. And lastly, um, most most separate processes could uh, benefit from some kind of addition of machine learning, or maybe even replacing fully with machine learning. Um, you could, for example, use machine learning for uh, post estimation or use object detection to easier localize. Uh, you might even be able to do the whole thing using machine learning and, and do the entire depth estimation using machine learning. 
you could also uh, combine the current implementation with machine learning and say, for example, use semantic segmentation to sort of remove areas of the image that we are not that interested in. For example, the floor or the sky or other parts that we might not need for mapping. So with that, we can conclude that cameras are uh, very powerful sensors. Um, they take in a lot of information, but it's kind of hard to extract that information and it requires quite a lot of work to make them useful. Um, vision based localization mapping is very capable, uh, even if it's single camera. Um, and it can definitely be used for navigation, but it has to be tuned properly and uh, especially using Python, there's sort of still a way to go. Uh, but since cameras are often crucial anyway, and, 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 and part of many of these implementations, um, there's not really a reason to not try this or at least have it on the table. Um, because as you can see, it, it can yield results much like uh, other sensors. Uh, we also see that the Jet Racer and the Python might not be the ideal um, software uh, or programming language and hardware for this. Um, the uh, Jet Racer is maybe a little bit too fast. Uh, the angle of the camera is not ideal and the processor might not be powerful enough uh, just because you still need to rely on the CPU quite a lot. And Python is missing quite a lot of support for uh, computer vision based uh, uh, libraries and especially with GPU processing. Lastly, we'd just like to say that uh, this is a very active area of uh, research and development and um, it looks like more and more this is moving towards machine learning. Um, so, so we're following uh, uh, the uh, development here very closely and uh, we're excited to see what happens next. So with that, I would just like to thank you for your attention and open it up for questions. It's very quiet, it's very quiet. No, oh, no, thank you. Thank you for a nice presentation. <laughs> it was interesting actually <laughs> to, to listen to you. Thank you very much, guys. It was really nice. Uh, I want to add also to your comment in the end, uh, just in addition to the question here, that yeah, I mean it's it's a nice result. I mean, and you you kind of showed that I mean with the approach you had it, you had limitations, but uh, I mean you can also run C plus plus on the on the jets, and there's not really the limitation. And Python, if Python is a problem for some reason, you can move away and use another software. That's the beauty of uh, with the system. It's not like you need to run it on Python. Plus the camera and stuff is something you could adjust basically. And the fact that we want to have it in a speedy racer is exactly, I mean, it's a goal. You know, we don't want to have a robot vacuum cleaner that would be maybe too simple, I would say. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, we wanted to see how it behaves when you're fast. I mean, this is why real time was a, an important point. So, I, I mean, I, your comments are perfect. It, it's not like against the, the comments. Uh, it's just uh, Future development could then focus on other things. So you basically figured out this is maybe a bit limiting, and next time you can do it better, do improvements on the on the race itself physically and also the software. Yeah, there was one thing we actually kind of forgot to note is that we are confident that this is uh, actually working in real time with the improvements that we propose. Yeah, uh, it's not that time consuming. So if you omit uh, some of the graphical tools and uh, and also if you Put the computation as Walter said on the GPU. It should be viable to a high extent uh, with a with a fast fa frame rate. Yeah. Um, but you still get the issue of motion blur. Mm -hmm. So you wanna you wanna sort of deal with that somehow because because of the speed of. So we get motion blur partly when we drive over an uneven surface, but even just from driving quickly, you get motion blurs on the sides of the camera, uh, and then that that's really hard to to use for the key point finding and the matching. So that's an issue. So maybe yeah. for the road tracking that is originally used mm -hmm. for those features are so distinct that even if there are is a lot of motion blur, you can still do the road tracking. But for this application, you need uh, clearer images to do the feature uh, matching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
but you could again i mean you could definitely solve that with some image stabilization yeah um both physical and maybe software wise i'm not sure um so there's you know but you need you need crisper clearer images yeah. Mm. but yeah exactly but as you said it's a good point that you you could implement uh, physical even physical and software image stabilization uh, yeah. and then you can omit these problems and maybe you yeah. have also a way of filtering out really blurry images if it doesn't work with stabilization that you guys just omit it in the algorithm and you still can track yeah them out. that's essentially what we're doing now that we get more we get blurry images we just skip them but the problem is of course that when you've done that too many times and because it's moving very quickly you sort of you miss out on a large chunk of uh, of area to view, and then um, we, we did once where we drove over the threshold and turned, and it had no idea where it was then because it was blurry, and we skipped a bunch of frames, and then it had nothing it could match with anymore because there was so much. The, the images were so different. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Alex has a question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I just want to say a very nice presentation, guys. Well done. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> OK. Um, there is uh, Robert and uh, Khan said something already, and then Elias. Uh, if there are no questions from anyone, you can also stop the recording.